I call to order this meeting of the Oversight Committee. It is, it is 9.01 a.m. We're holding this meeting by video conference via Zoom due to continued COVID-19 precautions. Before we start the agenda, I want to go over a few technical points. If you are not speaking, make sure that your microphone is on mute. Please leave your cameras on for the entire meeting. This is the easiest way to see that we are maintaining a quorum of members. And finally, if an oversight committee member disconnects from the meeting and cannot reconnect, contact Michael Fisher or Terry Simeon to help you rejoin the meeting. Um, we're moving on to roll call. I know that I just asked you to mute yourselves, but for the roll call, make sure that your microphone is on. Dr. Cummings, please proceed. Mr. Margo. Present. Here. Dr. Hernandez. Present. Mr. Montgomery. Here. Dr. Patel. Yeah. Mrs. Payne. Present. Dr. Rice. Here. Dr. Roosevelt. Here. We have a quorum. Members, the draft minutes from the August 19th Oversight Committee meeting are available in your agenda packet behind tab one. Are there any corrections to the minutes as circulated? The chair will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of August 19th Oversight Committee meetings. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Our next agenda item is public comment. Public feedback is critically important because CPRT was created to help Texans. Open, opening our meetings with public comment underscores this broad, this broad commitment to transparency and accountability. Mrs. Doyle, has CPRT received any request to provide public comment? Yes, sir. Okay. We invited Angelos Angelo to this meeting so that we could honor his service to Texas as a separate board member. We had hoped to do this in person, but COVID interfered with our plans and we didn't want to delay this recognition any longer. As you know, Mr. Angelou served as an oversight committee meeting, com committee member for seven years, starting in early 2013. Seifert benefited from his well-regarded expertise in technology-based economic development, public policy, investment attraction, and entrepreneurship. Speaking on behalf of my colleagues, we benefited from his steadfast dedication to Seifert's mission. In recognition of your service, Angelos, we have prepared a resolution in your honor. Before I read that resolution, I wanna give you an opportunity to speak. Well, I want to uh, thank the, the governor for uh, allowing me to serve for seven years at Seifert. I want to thank all of you for all the support you had given me during my seven years of service at, um, as an oversight member. Um, I will say there were times where I felt like um, many of the meetings were way, way above my pay scale because I'm not a medical expert, but I truly enjoyed serving the state of Texas and this worthy cause. Um, one thing that I will not miss about Seaprit is having to wear a suit. <laughs> 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 every time that I was uh, at this meeting. So thank you all for the wonderful opportunity and the discussions we've had on the sidelines and for all the support you've given me. Thank you, Angelos. And now I'd like to read the following resolution into the record. Whereas Angelos Angelou was appointed by Governor Rick Perry as an oversight committee member of the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas on March 1st, 2013. And whereas Mr. Angelou assumed the role as oversight committee member during a critical period of regaining the confidence of the Texas legislature and the citizens of Texas for CEPR to resume its role in the fight against cancer. And whereas Mr. Angelou was pivotal, pivotal in restoring that confidence. And whereas Mr. Angelou worked selfless, selflessly for and on behalf of CEPR giving his time, prestige, and energy without remuneration. And whereas Mr. Angelou steadfastly performed the duties of his office with equanimity, determination, and poise. And whereas Angelou's, Angelos Angelou earned the respect and admiration of Seifert staff through his dedication in furthering the mission of Seifert 
And whereas Angelo, Angelos Angelou likewise earned the respect of his fellow oversight committee meeting through his wise counsel on the product development subcommittee, and whereas Secret's mission of promoting prevention, academic research, and product development research advanced under Angelos Angelou's guidance to the benefit of all Texans, now therefore be it resolved that the Oversight Committee of the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas hereby recognizes Angelos Angelou for his distinguished service to the citizens of the state of Texas and expresses its gratitude for his many and lasting contributions to the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas and be it further resolved that an official copy of this resolution be prepared for Angelos Angelou as an expression of high regard by oversight committee members and secret staff. I will entertain a motion approving this resolution. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay, the motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you all. Mr. Margo, if I could, if I could say a word, please. Uh, Wayne, it's not here in the script. I'm sorry. Well, I'm gonna. I, no, I'm, go I, I'm gonna. Go ahead. I, I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna cut in. Uh, I just want to say um, that along with Bill Rice and Will Montgomery, Angelos came on board during a time of considerable tension in 2013. It, it took a lot of gumption to accept the Seaford appointment at that time. And our ability to weather the storm was only possible due to the reputations placed on the line by Angelos and the other reset oversight committee appointments. From the staff, thank you, Angelos. We are also, when we get you the resolution, going to be providing you with a little token of our appreciation. But seriously, uh, we couldn't have done it without you, Chief. Thank you so much, Wayne. And um... Thank you for the cause that all of you are involved with. I strongly believe in it and um, hopefully to more progress. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. And Angelos, if you, if you want to stick around and for the whole meeting, you're welcome to. <laughs> and, <laughs> unfortunately, I have another call in 15 minutes. So <laughs> thank, you, thought, uh, thank you, Dee. Thank you, Dee. That's my uh, Will Montgomery facetiousness. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, congratulations, Angelos. We miss you. you. Thank you so much. All right. All right, we'll continue. We have invited two secret grantees to make presentations to the Oversight Committee about the work that they are doing. Dr. Patrick Sung is first up. He is a secret scholar recruited to the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. And following Dr. Sung, Dr. Dr. May Wang will update us on the work Seaport is, Seaport is supporting at Instapath, Inc. Dr. Wilson, will you introduce Dr. Soon? Thank you, Mr. Argo. Yes, uh, it is a pleasure to have this opportunity to welcome Dr. Patrick Sung to um, the Oversight Committee meeting. Um, just a little bit about Dr. Sung, following his undergraduate education at the University of Liverpool, UK, and doctorate in biochemistry at Oxford, and then postgraduate training at the University of Rochester, Dr. Sung began his academic career in Texas, first as an assistant professor at the University of Texas Medical Branch Galveston, and then at the uh, UT Health Science Center of San Antonio until 2002, when he left Texas for Yale, where he led the Department of Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry until two years ago, when he was recruited back to the University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio, as a secret established investigator and their associate dean for research. And Dr. Sung has a distinguished record of research accomplishment and um, notable, he was among the first to understand the roles of BCR1 and 2 genes. You recognize these as the genes most affected in hereditary breast and ovary cancer and these insights have led to new treatment strategies. Among the notable awards and recognition that he's received last year, he won the National Cancer Institute's Outstanding Investigator Award that provides him with funding over a seven year period in recognition of both his accomplishments, but also the expectation of his continued impact on cancer and cancer treatments. So 
again, uh, welcome, Dr. Sung. First and foremost, thank you so very much, Dr. Wilson, for that fantastic introduction. And we're really grateful for the opportunity to present a summary of what we have been doing about delineating the mechanisms of DNA repair. And today I'm gonna to convince you, at least I will try, that what we do has very strong relevance for understanding the etiology of different types of cancer and also paving the path to finding cures for them over time. I would like to start out by reminding everybody that cancer still is a leading cause of death everywhere. In the United States is accounting for about one in four deaths. And in 2019, more than 1600 people a day die from cancer of various kinds. Unfortunately, cancer is not a singular disease. It's actually a very complex combination of different types of diseases collectively known as cancer. So finding a cure to them all is, is not a trivial matter. And in this regard, I'm so very grateful as well as fellow cancer researchers are so very grateful for the support that the great state of Texas is according to uh, uh, our research programs. Now, cancer can be caused by uh, various factors, including DNA damage that occurs continuously in our DNA and the failure to repair the DNA damage leads to mutations and uh, chromosomal instability. I'm gonna give you an example or two as I go along. Cancer can also be caused by viral infection and bacterial infection. Um, that's incontrovertible evidence that infections of different kinds can indirectly or directly lead to cancer. Uh, cancer can also be uh, caused by changes in hormonal levels and the type of uh, hormones that are secreted in the body and also by chronic inflammation. Now, I'm not an expert in inf infection-related cancer etiology, nor am I an expert in understanding the role of hormonal changes and also chronic inflammation, uh, how they lead to the cancer state and so on. But I do know something about DNA damage and its repair. This is the focus um, of my presentation today. Our DNA is damaged continuously by high energy radiation, even while we're sitting talking to one another, uh, our DNA is cons constantly being damaged by radiation that penetrates building and so on. If you go to the dental office, you take an X-ray, the few chromosomal breaks that will be induced, okay, in your DNA and so on. I'll come back to talk about, you know, how we deal with eliminating those uh, DNA lesions. The long and short of it is that mutations and chromosomal operations are, are, are actually quite infrequently uh, arise in, uh, within our cells, even though DNA damage occurs consistently. One was prompted to ask the question, why? Why is this the case? Why we are still alive? Thank God we're still alive walking around, most of us, um, uh, in, in a very healthy. Uh, I wish you all the best in your health and so on. This is because our genetic material, even though it's subject to continuous uh, damage, is being kept intact by DNA repair. Now, my goal here is not to walk you through all the chemistry, all the myriad DNA damage uh, types that can occur to, to our body, to our cells, and so on. But just to sum up that understanding DNA damage and repair is a complex issue because of the myriad types of uh, DNA damage that can occur, including uh, high energy radiation, I alluded to this already. In fact, some of the uh, anti-tumor drugs, anti-cancer drugs, um, exert their efficacy via uh, uh, damaging DNA. Uh, these agents can cause DNA strand breaks, okay? Our DNA consists of two DNA strands, um, can cause strand breaks and so on. Exposure to ultraviolet light um, and chemicals that are prevalent in our environment can cause very bulky addicts in our DNA and they cause trouble. It goes on and on and on. Again, I emphasize that it's not my goal to walk you through all the chem chemistry, and all the different myriad you know, DNA damage types and so on, but to highlight, okay, the complexity of the problem. Now it's been estimated, I think this number is pretty close to reality. Uh, when, when a cell is in a proliferative uh, state, that means that the cell is able to uh, divide, uh, up to 1 million DNA lesions can accumulate in each cell of our body. Okay, we have about 4 trillion cells in our body. Uh, you can do your math, <laughs> you can do your calculation. It just mind boggling, you know, gazillion DNA lesions occur every single day in every cell. Now, inability to eliminate DNA damage in a favorable manner invariably lead to a DNA mutations and also a more noticeable chromosome aberrations. Let me walk you through the basis of this. 
Um, we all know that uh, our humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 pairs of them are common, uh, and also a pair of a uh, sex chromosome, male will be XY, female will be uh, 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 XX. Let's look at this uh, cancer genome, okay? We call this cancer genome uh, a karyotype, which is really a fancy way of saying that this is our genetic content of a normal cell or of a cancer cell. Let's look at what's wrong with this particular cancer uh, karyotype. Uh, normally we will have a pair of each of our chromosomes, one her inherited from mom, the other one from dad. I look at chromosome one in this particular individual. Oh, by the way, this individual looks like it's a female, although there are three copies of a, a X chromosome instead of being two, being the norm. Look at the, this particular individual. This is a cancer, okay, a karyotype from this individual. Chromosome one has a quiet piece of another chromosome somewhere, most likely chromosome five. And this individual in this particular cell, okay, has only one copy of chromosome five instead of having a pair. Okay, and then you have a long deletion, a big deletion in chromosome three, on and on and on. If you look at it very closely, you find all types of problems associated with uh, this uh, cancer karyotype. And this is very common, okay, in cancer. This by no means uh, unique to this particular individual. Now, when you talk about DNA repair, this is not a singular system of DNA repair. There are different types of DNA repair pathways. Some of them are overlapping in their action, but mostly they're mechanistically distinct. So when you talk about DNA repair, this is an incredibly complex problem. Um, not a single laboratory can focus on all types of DNA repair pathways. So we have to pick and choose depending on our expertise, training, and so on. For the past 25 years or so, first started at the University of Texas, uh, we have been focusing on how cells go about eliminating a class of lesions, so-called DNA double-stranded break. That means that both of the strands in, in our DNA uh, genetic material have been damaged and, and broken, basically. Uh, this is an incredibly complex process. It requires many, many lectures, okay, in, in the classroom setting in order to go through all of them because of time and also the purpose of this presentation. I'm gonna stop there about uh, DNA repair in general. So let's focus on DNA double stranded breaks a little bit more. Where are these breaks coming from? Exposure of cells to high energy radiation, including X-ray, even dental X-ray, or, or health related X-ray you know, analysis and so on can cause DNA double stranded breaks. So you don't want to take X-ray you know, too often um, but because of that reason. And also other types of high energy radiation, including a class of radiation called ionizing radiation that can penetrate buildings and so on. Now I alluded to this already, uh, treatment of cells with cancer therapeutics, including salts of uh, platinum, which is very common in use to treat all types of malignancy, can also lead to a DNA double strand break formation. And when DNA is being replicated, in other words, when cells divide, the DNA material has to be replicated. When that process is ongoing, uh, uh, DNA damages, including DNA double strand break, can also be introduced into our genetic material. And DNA strand breaks can also arise when cells go about trying to repair a certain class of lesions and so on. Um, the etiology and the background is really complicated, but just to give you an idea of where these lesions are coming from. Now, I have to acknowledge a real pioneer in our field who really started the field by connecting DNA double strand break repair to cancer when that process fails. This individual's name is Mary Claire King. Uh, she was the discoverer of the BRCA1 gene and subsequently provided cellular data to implicate BRCA1 in DNA double-stranded break repair. This is a very distinguished, incredibly revered person, okay, in our field, uh, winner of the uh, National Medal of Science and also the uh, Alaska Koshland Award. This is a very, very prestigious award. And I would not be surprised that uh, Mary Claire will win the Nobel Prize one day, and I hope she does, okay. Uh, so long and short of it is that both BRCA1, identified by Mary Claire King, and BRCA2, later identified by a different research group, play a crucial role in DNA double strand break repair. Uh, so clearly linking what we do uh, to cancer etiology. A little bit of uh, cancer uh, genetics here to give you a little bit of background to orient, uh, orient you a little bit. Unfortunately, about one in eight women um, would develop breast cancer over, over the you know, uh, lifespan. Uh, about maybe one in 100 to one in 50 women would develop uh, ovarian cancer. Uh, if you harbor a BRCA, BRCA1 mutation, depending on the nature of the mutation, how deleterious that mutation is and so on, 
uh, the risk of breast cancer goes up to four to seven fold or so. If you have a mutation in BRCA2, the same situation arises. The, the risk for breast cancer goes up quite a bit. And also for ovarian cancer, the risk of developing ovarian cancer, if you either have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, goes up maybe 10, up to 30 fold or so. Important for me to emphasize that BRCA1 and BRCA2 don't just get involved in suppression of breast and ovarian cancer because they also feature very prominently in the etiology of other types of cancers, including prostate cancer, male breast cancer, as well as pancreatic cancer. Okay, you, you can look at the uh, numbers here. So risks go up when you have a mutation in either BRC, BRCA1 and BRCA2 in multiple organs, not just in the breast and ovary. Now we have um, very high profile um, uh, personalities, okay, coming out in the open uh, to talk about um, uh, the issues with uh, dealing with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. This is the most famous, okay, of these cases, and Angelina Jolie, uh, everybody knows her. I like her as an actress and so on. She came out in the open to talk about her uh, surgery to remove her breast and also ovary because she harbors a BRCA1 mutation a particularly deleterious form of BRCA1 mutation. And because of that, it's been estimated that her lifetime risk of developing breast cancer is 87%. It's almost for certain, if she didn't have her breast removed, she would get breast cancer somewhere down the line. And her um, uh, ovarian cancer risk was estimated to be about 50% or so. So she had the prophylactic removal of her uh, breast and ovary. This is a very effective prophylactic uh, uh, measure in order to avoid you know, cancer formation. But it's a really terrible one. Um, a, a woman has to lose very vital, important uh, organs in order to avoid uh, the, the development of cancer. We've got to do better, okay, in terms of finding new cancer therapeutics and so on. This, this is one of our goals, is to find efficacious cancer therapeutics to treat uh, familial as well as sporadic, okay, breast and ovarian cancer. Here, a little bit of selfish uh, uh, advertisement of our research contributions. So I studied studying um, uh, DNA double strand break repair when I was a junior faculty at UTMB in Galveston. In 1994, I published this very highly cited paper, okay, highly cited by other researchers in the field, uh, showing that one of the key enzymes in DNA double strand break repair called ysrf 51 has a certain enzymatic activity that directly implicates it in the DNA repair reaction. More recently in 2017, this was done at Yale University, uh, leading a big group of uh, researchers, we were able to purify the BRCA1 protein and demonstrate its role in DNA double strand brick repair. So science and nature papers, um, these are very leading journals, okay, in our field, um, help propel us, okay, to where we are today. We were lucky to have very good people working on these projects. So what about our drug development effort here? Let me just explain the concept behind it. Let me explain the concept of so-called synthetic lethality. So think about this. Let's say we want to go from San Antonio to Austin. There are two roads to get to Austin. If you block one of the roads, uh, we still have the other one that we can take to go to Austin. But if you block both of the roads, we stop, okay? So the synthetic lethality uh, idea at the cellular uh, level goes something like this. So if you consider that there are two different pathways that are capable of repairing a certain class of DNA lesions, if you block one of them, the cells can take, okay, root B, okay, cell still survives when DNA damage occurs. If you block root B, okay, root A is still available to allow cells to remove the DNA damage and survives. But if you simultaneously block root, both roots A and B, cells have no way of removing the DNA lesion, so cell perishes. So how do we translate that into a real life uh, cancer treatment okay, situation? Let's consider BRCA uh, uh, a tumor. Uh, I hope I have been able to convince you that BRCA1 and BRCA2 are involved in DNA repair. So in a BRCA1 mutant okay, cancer cell, you have an inherent DNA repair deficiency to begin with. That normally allows a cell, okay, to use other pathways, okay, to avoid cell death. But in this case, if you treat these BRCA mutant cells with a class of uh, chemicals that further damage DNA to target other DNA repair pathways. Uh, the example used here, a new class of um, cancer therapeutics called the PARP inhibitors, never mind what they look like chemically and so on. These are very exciting new drugs for cancer treatment. 
the BLCA mutants, okay, is no longer able to survive because of the increased DNA damage load. So they perish. So tumor cells die. Normal cells, on the other hand, they are normal for BLCA. They're still able to use other DNA repair pathways, even with the treatment of uh, PARP inhibitors. Okay, so they survive. So the end result is that you differentially kill off all the tumor cells to allow normal tissues to live. So to avoid very deleterious side effects and so on. So the PARP inhibitors are very exciting class of uh, uh, cancer therapeutics that are being further developed. Um, so let me sum up our goals at UT Health San Antonio. We will continue based on what we've done in the past 25 years or so to continue dissect how BLCA1, BLCA2 go about uh, helping mediate DNA repair mechanism. We also wish to understand the mechanistic basis of different drug resistant mechanism because knowing why a patient initially respond to cancer drugs but later on develop resistance is critically important to find other ways to overcome that uh, drug resistant mechanism. And we're doing that. Um, we're making some inroad in, in this particular regard. And of course, using the concept of synthetic lethality, we're striving to develop new cancer therapeutics to specifically treat BLCA deficient tumors. More importantly, or just as importantly, uh, we are working diligently with colleagues in the National Cancer Institute designated Mace Cancer Center. You see in our background, okay, you wonder what that watercolor is. It's a depiction of our cancer center. It's a beautiful building. We're working with colleagues, okay, in terms of reaching out to the community, educate the community about cancer risk, uh, options that are available for cancer treatment and so on. This is actually a very important goal that we, expanding a lot of effort, okay, to, in order to accomplish. Just as important um, as I have done in the past 25 years or so, 20 some years or so, I would like to help my junior faculty colleague in the career development, helping them with the grant application, advising them, okay, in issues concerning um, student training, uh, publications, grant applications, and so on. Likewise, we would like to help mentor students and postdoctoral fellows of the highest possible caliber to prepare them for uh, a future career in cancer research. I will end by um, uh, making some very important uh, acknowledgements. I would like to thank the more than 50 uh, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows that have gone through my lab. And of course, also the uh, technical staff will play a, a crucial role in our relative success up to this point. I want to point out that many of my former students and uh, postdoctoral fellows are now tenure faculty here in the United States, in Asia, in Europe, you name it, okay, they all over the place. Science is really international, okay, in nature. And, but practically all of them are still involved in science. I'm particularly proud of that. So I have a hundred percent track record of training people who stay in science in one way or another. So I'm pretty proud of that. Um, and I would like to acknowledge the uh, very generous support from the great state of Texas, okay, from the secret mechanism. I, I was the recipient of a recruitment of established investigator award in 2019, that has really done a whole lot to enable us to move the lab from very basic cancer biology into drug development and so on. I would like to really thank Secret, okay, and, and, the, and the citizens of Texas for being so generous uh, in uh, supporting cancer research. Uh, we also like to thank uh, UT Health San Antonio for providing the infrastructure and ongoing support, and also the uh, United States National Institutes of Health in most prominently the National Cancer Institute for the ongoing support. The NIH has been very kind to us, okay? In, in return, I'm doing a lot for the NIH by serving on uh, panels, reviewing panels, uh, recruitment panels, and so on. I would also like to thank uh, the, the Welch Foundation for pro providing me with a distinguished chair. But this actually provides a lot of ongoing support, okay, for our research program. And also the Gray Foundation of New York for supporting our BRCA work. I'll stop there and take questions if you have any. Thank you, Dr. Sung. Members, do you have any questions? I don't hear any. Thank you, Dr. Sung. Um, I will stop sharing now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Walker-Peach, will you introduce Dr. Wang? I am happy to do so. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, media uh, members. Thank you, Dr. Sun, for that wonderful presentation. It really brings to mind exactly what we're trying to do here at, uh, at Seabird. I had the opportunity to meet Mary Claire King early in my career. And as I think many of you know, her foundational discovery is the basis for the company, a very successful company called Myriad Genetics. 
uh, that helps with cancer elucidation. So thank you for bringing that, bringing that forward and it kind of meets exactly our goal for today. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mei Wang, who is the CEO of Instapath Inc. Uh, Dr. Wang is a biomedical engineer by training, uh, but importantly, she is an entrepreneur. She took her degrees from Tulane University and then co-founded Instapath on her research discoveries during her tenure at Tulane. Uh, Instapath Inc. is a CEPRA 2019 seed awardee company that is located in Houston, Texas. Uh, Dr. Wang's update is regarding the rapid pathology device for biopsies that she and her colleagues are developing. Um, welcome, Dr. Wang. It is a pleasure to have you have you here today. Please join us. Thank you so much for your introduction. Hello, everyone. I am May, and I'm the co-founder and CEO at Instapath. And uh, at Instapath, we're building an automated digital pathology lab for rapid on-site diagnosis. For today's presentation, I'll first give a brief introduction of Instapath. I'll talk about the problem we're solving and our approach to solve the problem. Next, I will talk about a little bit about um, how CPR funding has helped us so far to achieve our goals. And then I'll touch on what we are doing next. And finally, we'll have a Q&A session. Currently, when you get a biopsy to test for cancer, it takes over a one week to analyze the tissue sample. You may wonder why it takes so long. That because the current gold standard diagnosis cannot be done in real time. The gold standard method is called permanent pathology. Almost all the cancer biopsies and cancer surgery utilizes this method to process the tissue samples before the pathologist make a diagnosis. As you can see here, it is a pretty complicated process. The goal of this process is to get a thin layer of the tissue sample on a microscope slide. So it can be observed under a traditional light microscope. In order to cut the sample very thin, we have to first preserve the sample. This is a chemical fixation process that will take at least one day. After that, we can embed the sample into paraffin, which is like a wax-like material. This makes the sample hard and easy to cut. Next, we can cut it with a microtome, which is pretty much like a mini deli slicer. After that, we can put this four to 10 micron thick tissue slice on the microscope slide. Next, we have to stain the sample on the slide so it can be easily observed. Finally, after sl the slide dries, we cover slip the slide to protect the sample. All these steps take typically one week to complete. At the end, at the end of this process, the pathologist can take a look at the slide and make a diagnosis. So if you want an answer at the time of procedure, instead of the chemical fixation process that takes over one day, the pathologist can freeze the sample to make it hard before cutting it, and then cut it into thin slices, stain it, observe it under the slide under the microscope. This method is called frozen section. However, the pathologists agree that frozen section doesn't provide the same result as permanent pathology, which means lower accuracy. Another problem with frozen section is that the sample is destroyed during this process, which means they can't run additional tests if they want to. Since biopsies are very small, they typically don't want to waste these precious, precious tissues. They want to use one piece of biopsy for multiple tests. Additionally, this process requires special, uh, specialized uh, equipment and highly trained personnel to perform, which is, which make it difficult for small clinics and hospitals to adopt. 
our goal at InstaPass is to provide a better alternative to the frozen section. Um, frozen section. So how many people are being affected by this problem? Every year, more than 15 million Americans have to get biopsies for cancer diagnosis or tumor removal surgeries as part of their cancer treatment plan. As I showed you previously, the current methods for diagnosing tissue samples are slow, inefficient, or inaccurate. As a result, on average, 20% of the patient will have to come back for another biopsy or surgery procedure. Not only this is painful and stressful for the patients and their physician, this also costs the US health system more than $1 billion each year. Since 2012, we have been working on solving this problem. We found the reason we have to go through all the complicated processing steps I showed earlier is because traditional microscopes can't be used to observe anything that is more than 10 microns thick. Our assumption was if we have a microscope that can see tissues without cutting it, that will make the whole process a lot faster and a lot easier. And we, and then we also get to save the tissue for downstream testing. So we started building a better microscope that doesn't require the sample to be thin. This way we can image the whole tissue in real time. After experimenting with several different types of microscope techniques, we found we can use a technology called structure illumination microscopy that combines optical sectioning and fluorescence microscopy at very high speed to achieve this goal. Here is a picture of our first prototype. After building our first prototype in 2012, we started testing on human and animal tissues. After a few rounds of redesign and testing the prototype, we finally got some great results. We tested our prototype on over 300 human samples. We found with our technology, we can image a fresh sample without cutting it. We can get an image of a biopsy that is close to the quality of permanent pathology in just a few minutes. And 95% of the time, our results are as accurate compared to the one week permanent pathology process. We published these exciting results in seven peer-reviewed publications. With this technology, we can reduce or even eliminate repeat procedures altogether. This way, we can potentially help hospitals to save money in personnel, room cost, and repeat procedures. For a hospital that performs 2,000 biopsies each year, that is more than $800,000 in savings. So in 2019, we decided to apply for CEPR funding to further develop this technology for commercial use. In February of 2019, we were successfully funded by CEPR. So what we have been up to since then? After got awarded the CEPR funding in the Q3 of 2019, we also successfully raised one $1.7 million in equity investment led by two Silicon Valley VCs, Draper Associates and Y Combinator. With the funding from Seabright and the equity investment, we started to develop our first product, Lucy. Using the technology we de developed in the lab as the base, we developed our first fully automated system, Lucy, that can render an image of a biopsy within five minutes. After collection, biopsy is placed in the disposable kit. Then Lucy take a high resolution image. Finally, the pathologist will read our image on machine learning assisted software. For our customers, we'll offer a lease model for the software and hardware and also generate recurring revenue through disposables. This picture on the left is our benchtop prototype I showed you earlier. And the picture on the right is our first Lucy system that was taken, uh, that, that, that picture was taken a couple of months ago. As you can see here, we made a lot of progress on product development. 
We also developed a pathology image sharing application called Lucy View. With Lucy View, the pathologist can review and evaluate the image wherever they are, as long as they have internet. Early the, earlier this year, we conducted a 20 sample pilot, a pilot with, a, with Baylor VA Hospital in Houston with previously frozen biobanking tissues. Here is a, a picture of Dr. Rosen, our collaborating pathologist on the first day of pilot and the two team members from Instapath. After using our, our system, Lucy, for a few days, this is what Dr. Rosen said while he was reviewing, uh, reviewing the images. The results are quite impressive now. This piece of lung is mesmerizing comparing to a typical frozen section. The recent colon cancer samples look very good as well. Applications at our institution for this technology are expanding. I got a request from our head and neck team to scan tracheal margins and from our dermatopathology team to scan most margins. Of course, we're very encouraged by this, um, by Dr. Rosen and the result he's been getting from Baylor and the VA hospital. Based on this feedback from this, this pilot, we're currently working on upgrading Lucy for the second pilot study that will start next year. Back in 2017, when we started the company, we started out with just the three founders. Now we have a team of eight full-time and one part-time employees with expertise in optics, mechanical engineering, embedded system engineering, software engineering, quality system, FDA, and marketing. I have talked about a lot about what have we have been done doing so far. Before we go, I want to tell you a little bit about what we are planning for the future. We will launch our first product, Lucy, in 2021 with the indication of aid in visualization. This will be a class one device. Next, we'll add the machine learning software to our second generation product, which will be a class two 510k device. We project a late 2022 to, late, uh, to 2023 launch date. Finally, we'll go through the FDA de novo pathway for primary diagnosis indication. Our estimated launch date for that product is going to be in 2026. We're in Instapath and we're building an automated digital pathology lab for rapid on-site diagnosis. We really want to thank Seaprit and the state of Texas for the support. Thank you very much. Now I will take questions. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Members, do you have any questions? I have, I have a question. Go ahead. Yes. Doctor, congratulations on an exceptional product. It's uh, there's nothing more frustrating uh, to a physician than having those terrible words come back over the phone. We don't have enough tissue. We need more tissue. We can't make the diagnosis. And having your patients have to go through another procedure just to get enough tissue. But I'm curious, as you were going through this, did you find that uh, your uh, um, automation here, how much did the uh, procedures have to um, influence this product as far as, is it mainly an improvement in the process or is it, because I know sometimes you, you have issues as a pathologist with the surgeon not giving you enough tissue or appropriate tissue. And how does that fit into this equation? Are you using less tissue? Uh, yeah, for, first of all, we don't lose any tissue during our process that like that overall already save you tissue. So you're not like cutting one slide for H and E, cutting another slide for another test, another slide for another test. And on top of this, we've been developing like novel markers, trying to see multiple things in one, one tissue without cutting it as well. As another goal we've been, uh, we've been working on. And on the flip side is we always, um, we always thought of there are two, uh, two part to this is like during your procedure, if you know you don't have enough tissue, you probably will try to get more. And I, I know in some cases that's not really achievable. 
and which on the other side, we can save you tissue just during the processing. But on the one side is if we can give you a somewhat preliminary result in five minutes, you can decide on what to do. And kind of our goal is just give you information and give you more information so you can make a more informed decision. Yes, yes, thank you, Doc. I see a lot of uh, usefulness, especially for our negative margins when we're operating. We want to know quickly. We don't want to hang around and have a patient to sleep for 30 minutes or an hour waiting around. But if this yep. works at the speed that you say it does, it's going to be a, a really good product for the for all of mankind. So congratulations. Wish thank you the best you of luck. Much. Thank you. Mr. Montgomery? Yes, uh, Doctor, uh, Doctor. thank you very much. It's, Fascinating presentation. I was wondering about the, the sample size that you used earlier. You had 312 sa samples, 95% accuracy. That leaves about 16 patients for which you either didn't know or didn't get the right diagnosis. Presumably, those, are, those results are old and they're improving, but what happens yes. to those 16 people? So we did that trial while we were still in academia, like we were doing very early research. And uh, those were, uh, those also were like samples from different organs and different, they have different sizes as well. It wasn't like all biopsies, some were biopsies, some were chunks, and some were, um, some were just margin tissues and and they were very various in sizes. And uh, we kind of just have a collective, this is our overall, um, overall um, accuracy. What we found was we were better in biopsies than bigger tissue, at least at that time, because what, uh, this is kind of our motivation for developing the machine learning assisted software is for larger areas is kind of more difficult for, um, for physicians to look through that bigger area because in traditional frozen section, you only get a little bit, but since our things is so far, so, so, so much faster, uh, they want to scan the whole thing. And then you ended up with a so much bigger area to go through. And then, so we did find that the difference and that kind of motivated us to develop the machine learning software. And we, we are very confident with that machine learning software, it will boost our uh, accuracy a lot. Does the, does the knowledge, if I may, Dr. Wang, does the knowledge for the machine learning come from your own samples or from an outside tissue base or where, how does the machine learn? What does it learn from? What is the library? Yeah, so there are already models that have been developed in pathology. And our, so what we decided to do is make our image look very similar to current h and &E image. And so we can borrow their already developed model and train using our uh, images again. And that's kind of what we've been doing. We're, it's still really early uh, for our machine learning software, but the good thing is our image look very similar to the regular h and &E, which many, many models has already been developed and then we can just use those models. Okay, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't hear any. Again, hey, I have a question. Who does? Craig? Okay, Craig. go ahead. Um, uh, thank you, May. Um, uh, just looking at the example you showed, it looks like you've done uh, some, some sort of tissue staining. Could the yes. technology also be used for, say, immunofluorescence, um, uh, immunohistochemistry, and, and other methods? Yes, we have tried some. Uh, but one of the thing, as you know, is we're uh, like we're aiming for five minutes. That's kind of like a because the current frozen section is about twenty minutes, and from our, our conversation with pathologist is and the physician, five minutes is, is a significant improvement for them to want to change. And for immuno immuno stains, the stain intake it takes a while. It's like it's a chemistry process. It typically can take an hour to two hours for some stain to just stain the things they're supposed to stain. And that's kind of our struggles right now and is how to make those stain faster. Um, um, but we are, but since 
if they're stained, yeah, our system works. Um, but the kind of the other thing we will not be able to offer is more instantaneous uh, result. Uh, we're working on it. There's, there's a lot of interest from uh, a lot of researchers and uh, physicians for immunohistochemistry markers for our, with our system. And we have been actively working on solutions to address those. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, again, thank you, Dr. Wang. We'll thank you now, very much. We'll now move on to agenda item number seven. Mr. Roberts will provide the Chief Executive Officer's report. Thank you, Mr. Margo. <clears throat> on page uh, three four in your meeting books is a summary of the uh, grant awards that are available. Uh, prior to any actions today, you have over $277 million out of 2021 appropriations for grant awards. Um, so you've got uh, plenty of funding since the PIC uh, is recommending 26 million in awards. Uh, I'd like to give a, a brief summary of COVID uh, activities, issues related to the agencies. Uh, as summarized in the memo, uh, we do continue our mandatory remote work policy for staff. And uh, uh, to date, we have reported nearly $1.7 million in COVID-related grantee expenses uh, to the Legislative Budget Board and the, the Governor's Office. Uh, there's a little bit of breakdown about the $1.7 million uh, in, the, in the cover memo, uh, as well as acknowledgement that uh, uh, the uh, reporting of grantee expenses uh, is expected to continue uh, for several more months. Uh, here in November, uh, after the election, uh, I will begin providing regular updates regarding the legislature and what we know about what is, what is occurring. Uh, some of this is uh, gonna be known to you just by virtue of watching the daily news. Uh, but the much anticipated blue wave did not occur uh, in the Texas legislature. Uh, the Senate Republicans lost one seat and now hold an 18 to 13 majority. Uh, a significant loss to Seaford is Senator Pat Fallon, uh, who has moved up to the U.S. Congress. Uh, Mr. Fallon, uh, towards the, the middle part of last session, uh, became a significant supporter of our Proposition 6 initiative uh, and was on uh, the advisory committee on, on getting it passed. So uh, Mr. Fallon will be sorely missed by us in the legislature, but uh, there's a lot of good he can do in, in Congress. Uh, in the House, uh, the Republicans maintained their majority at 83 to 67. Uh, a significant loss for Seifert was Republican Sarah Davis from Houston. Uh, she has carried significant Seifert legislation over the years, uh, and as a cancer supporter, was a uh, uh, as cancer survivor, was a big supporter of, of our activities. So, Ms. Davis will be missed, and we of course wish her uh, luck in, in her future endeavors. Uh, not running again. Uh, which affects us was Dr. John Zerwas, who's now with the University of Texas System, uh, and Senator Kirk Watson, who's now uh, running a, a major center at the University of Houston. Uh, those two obviously have been key to Seifert for, for quite a number of years. It appears that Representative Dade Phelan of Beaumont uh, has the sufficient votes to become the next speaker. Uh, he has been a supporter of Seifert. He's not carried our legislation previously, but looking back uh, since 2013, uh, he has supported every piece of legislation affecting Seifert. So I'm optimistic uh, that we've got strong support or will have strong support out of the speaker's office. Early filing began a week or so ago, uh, early filing of legislation to date one bill, Senate Bill 74 by Boris Miles has been filed. Uh, this is a piece of legislation that we were aware was being developed uh, and it affects uh, 
the uh, Methodist Hospital Research Institute in Houston. Current law excludes the institute and similar institutes uh, from being eligible to use the indirect cost recovery credit towards their required match for secret awards. Statute restricts this, in, this uh, uh, authorization to institutions of higher education specified in section 61.003 of the Texas Education Code. And that excludes independent research institutes such as Methodist. This institute, Methodist Institute, has been quite active uh, with SECRET. To date has 10 awards, including a core facility and two uh, recruitment awards. And they're having to put up a hard dollar match is difficult for them as it was for traditional institutions of higher education when this authorization uh, was put into, into law. <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, Kristen in particular communicated with the governmental affairs representatives of the Institute as they considered this legislative fix. Uh, we have no objections to their getting this authorization and have signaled as such uh, to Senator Nelson as well as uh, Senator, Senator uh, Miles. Um, we, uh, in sort of uh, coming to an end here, uh, we had our statutorily required budget hearing with staff of the Legislative Budget Board and the governor on November the 6th. It literally was limited to three minutes and it's probably a harbinger of things to come uh, in the upcoming legislative session, i.e video conferencing and extreme brevity. Since no real information was exchanged or discussion occurred, uh, we did arrange one-on-one -on -one meetings with key staff of the governor, lieutenant governor, uh, speaker of the house, Senate finance and house appropriations in order to, to make our case. Uh, and we had sufficient time uh, to impart upon them the, the importance of, of our request. Uh, our legislative briefing materials are being prepared right now concurrent with the development of our statutorily required annual report that will be due at the end of January. Uh, a lot of those briefing documents uh, use information derived from the annual report, particularly graphics uh, and associated charts. The key briefing documents, for example, the one that we call the green ball document, which I believe you've seen on numerous occasions, will not significantly change other than the, the metrics involved. Uh, with that, Mr. Margo, I'll close and I will try and respond to any questions you folks may have. Any questions for Mr. Roberts? Yes, Mr. Roberts? Yes, sir. Senator Miles. The yes. legislation you're referring to is that, did you say it was for Methodist Hospital? Methodist Hospital Institute. It's a research institute associated. It's a separate legal entity, but it is affiliated with Methodist Hospital. Right, and, and is the legislation, have you seen it? Yes, sir. And is it uh, specific for that institution only? The Senator Miles is gonna be trying to pass or for in general? It, it, it would include similarly, similarly structured institutes. Uh, I believe there's another one uh, in Waco associated with Baylor, Scott and White. Uh, Kristen may know of some others, but uh, it was a Methodist that, that uh, brought this to everyone's attention. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on. The chair recognizes Mr. Burgess to present the chief compliance officer's report. Good morning, Mr. Margo, oversight committee members. Uh, you'll find my compliance report behind tab four, your virtual tab four, four dash one. Um, just a couple of highlights there. Our delinquent reporting as of the end of October, we had five reports delinquent. Four of those were academic research and one was product development research. As you may recall, we receive roughly 550 uh, reports every month and our threshold is about 28.5%. So we're well below that uh, threshold. Uh, training and support, we did conduct our third series of trainings at the beginning of October, and this is on 4-2. Uh, 
Um, we provide training specific to each program and we had a little over 250 uh, grantee staff attend those trainings. Again, that was the final series of this year and 100% of our grantees have met that requirement uh, of uh, attending a compliance training. On 4-3, I uh, wanted to provide some highlights of FY20 compliance activities. The first chart there on 4-3 uh, is our monthly average of delinquent reporting. We did have a slight increase this year from uh, FY19 to FY20. This is a monthly average of 14 reports per month, uh, mostly attributed to COVID-19 uh, delinquency rates, as you could imagine. Um, but we have <clears throat> kind of kept it uh, fairly low um, um, back in, in FY15. So we're, we do meet on a weekly basis as uh, an agency with operations staff, fiscal staff, compliance staff. We do reach out to grantees to make sure they get their reports in on time. That next bullet there for training education, we provided 24 trainings this past year and those were new grantee trainings that are required, uh, new authorized signing official trainings and annual compliance trainings. And we had almost 700 staff attend those. And if you'll go over to 4-4, these two charts uh, speak to um, the compliance reviews and the findings analysis for each stat. So the top is for desk reviews. We conducted about 140 desk reviews this past year and 17 on site. We did see an increase in both from uh, FY19 to FY20. Again, most of this is attributed to delinquent reporting uh, that we found uh, in, in our grantees. And that's all that I have. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Burgess? Okay, uh, turning to the certification of, of the two award slates that we will consider today, Mr. Burgess, Will you provide the compliance certification report for the academic research awards? Yes, thank you, Mr. Margo. So the compliance certification uh, is in your proposed grant award booklet, and that's on page 25 of that booklet. The memo is dated November the 6th, and that was provided to you uh, and made available in the portal. I reviewed the compliance pedigrees for the grant application submitted to CFRT for the recruitment of established investigators and the recruitment of first time tenure track faculty members. I've had several conversations with CFRT staff and General Dynamics Information Technology, GDIT, our third party grants administrator. I have reviewed all the supporting documentation, including third party observer reports uh, for each peer review meeting. I also attended the program integration committee, the PIC meeting on November the 4th. Um, and I uh, confirmed that the uh, uh, peer review process uh, followed applicable laws and agency administrative rules. And I certify these award recommendations for your consideration this morning. Are there any questions for Mr. Burgess? All right, we will now move on to agenda item number nine. The chair recognizes Dr. Wilson to provide the academic research program update and introduce the program integration committee committee's grant award recommendations. Um, behind tab five, you'll find um, a, a number of items. Uh, particularly noted, notable are a series of tables that uh, Patty Moore has uh, developed that give you a snapshot of First of all, in the table one, um, the results from last year's RFAs, um, individual investigator research awards, um, core facility, et cetera. And uh, just to summarize, the individual investigator research award success rate, that is the number of um, uh, funded applications um, uh, was about 14% and for individual investigator research awards and about 23% for core facility support awards are major instruments, if you will. 
And this has been um, a success rate that has been consistent over the last decade, uh, quite interestingly. Um, also shown is the um, success rate for uh, it's uh, for the different um, recruitment awards. Uh, notable is that last year, as the year before, we saw the largest number of um, applications for recruitment awards, and the success rate was 49% last year, uh, again, um, hitting about the same mark as previously. Um, finally, we follow a number of parameters, uh, including the impact of research awards on uh, ability to gain additional peer review funding. We call that follow-on funds. Um, we follow the publications resulting from CPERT awards and patents granted. And these data are summarized um, for your review for the past decade uh, for each of the different mechanisms that um, have been employed over the past um, over the past decade. So I'll, I'll leave those for, uh, for your review. Those are the sorts of data that we will continue to provide on an annual basis. Um, if I now may go to um, two action items. Um, the first action item is to um, report on the results from the PIC um, recommendations for recruitment cycles of the past quarter. And Patty, if I could have the first slide, you'll see that there are nine recruitment awards uh, totaling $26 million. Two of these are for recruitment of established investigators and seven are for recruitment of first time tenure track faculty. Uh, I'll note that three of the nine that I'll be telling you about address computational biology and analytical methods priority and two um, are focused on hepatocellular cancer, uh, two of the uh, priorities identified by the Oversight Committee. The next slide um, is, are the two uh, established investigator um, awardees recommended. Uh, both are to MD Anderson for the recruitment first of Dr. Bassan al Lasanki, uh, who is a computational biologist uh, who currently is at the Institute of Cancer Research in London. Um, her work applies data science to inform uh, the discovery of new therapeutics. And it's a particularly important um, talent that marries well with MD Anderson's um, five or six years of uh, intense uh, curating of their clinical data as part of the Apollo, what they call the Apollo project, which is basically to capture all of the clinically relevant data as well as um, uh, biochemical and other types of data from patients who are cared for there. And this is a rich data source for data scientists uh, to then go back and ex uh, examine for opportunities for identifying new therapeutic targets. Um, the second established investigator award um, is also to MD Anderson to recruit Dr. Peter Van Loo uh, from the Francis Crick Institute in London as well. Uh, Dr. Van Loo is a computational scientist uh, and, uh, and a genomics expert who uses computer analysis to um, analyze further the DNA sequencing data um, that's accruing as part of um, our ability now to analyze uh, clinical tissues quite rapidly for the intricacies of genetic changes. And again, um, his recruitment ties very nicely with MD Anderson's um, uh, commitment to uh, uh, acquiring quite considerable amounts of genomic data on patients who are being cared for there. Next slide, please, Patty. Um, seven um, first-time tenure-track faculty um, candidates are shown here. This is really quite an exciting group um, that captured the imagination and enthusiasm of our Scientific Review Council. And I'll just give you a brief um, snapshot of these extraordinary group of new investigators who hopefully will be recruited to Texas with CFERT support. The first is to Baylor College of Medicine to recruit um, Dr. Fazel, a uh, computational 
uh, biologist from Stanford School of Medicine. The second is Dr. Guy Neer, um, who is, uh, uh, would be recruited to UT Medical Branch from Harvard. Uh, you recall from Dr. Sung's earlier presentation, the, uh, the amount of disruption in the chromosomal patterns of cancers. And Dr. Neer, during his um, uh, postdoctoral training, has been involved in and contributing to very new approaches high resolution imaging to examine these structures, uh, chromosomal abnormalities in a way that hasn't been possible in the past. Um, next is Dr. Jehan Osborne. Uh, she is a cancer biologist who began her research career at UT Southwestern and then went on to a very distinguished postdoctoral uh, uh, experience at Harvard Medical School. And is, UT Southwestern is very anxious to recruit her back to, um, uh, to Texas, uh, not the least of which uh, reason is that she, as an African-American woman, uh, demonstrates uh, a number of important uh, uh, role model opportunities for navigating the, um, if you will, the um, academic um, trajectory of training and promises to be an extraordinary role model for uh, such other underrepresented individuals uh, in academic medical research. Uh, the next is Ji Li Zun, who is um, uh, being recruited to UT Health Science Center at San Antonio from uh, University of California, San Diego. Uh, she studies the role of altered metabolism and its impact on non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which all of you recognize as a precursor of liver cancer. Next slide. Um, and then uh, next is Janine, uh, Janine Van Nostrum uh, being recruited by Baylor College of Medicine from the Salk Institute. She also studies the uh, signaling pathways in, involved in the progression of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease to liver cancer. Pavan Bakreddy is a physician scientist being recruited to MD Anderson from Dana-Farber Dana -Farber Harvard Cancer Institute. Um, he plans to use immune therapy approaches to enhance the uh, treatment of leukemia. And then last is Mauro uh, Di Pilato, a immunologist who is being recruited to the um, MD Anderson Department of Immunology led by Jim Allison from the Research uh, Biomedics Institute in Switzerland. So um, in summary, these are nine uh, very extraordinary recruitment opportunities for Texas institutions of higher learning, two established investigators, and seven um, first-time tenure track. And Mr. Margo, I don't know whether you want to consider this um, this item now or, or wait until the uh, next action item that I have to present. Um, Kristen, what do you recommend? Sorry, I had to get myself off mute. Uh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Wilson, and present the next item and then we'll do votes on all of them at the end. Terrific, so the next slide um, summarizes um, five investigator, uh, individual investigator research award RFAs that the uh, research oversight committee reviewed and is recommending for um, the fiscal year, uh, first cycle of fiscal year 22. These um, RFAs would be, if approved, would be published in January. Um, applications received between March and June and then um, the review would occur late summer, early fall, and you would see the results next or, or um, February uh, FY 22. Uh, you're familiar with all five of these as they are um, have been represented in, uh, in each of the past five years of CPRT um, Individual Investigator Research Award uh, RFAs. The first supports a broad range of projects um, the second is a uh, RFA targeting projects focused on cancer in children and adolescents. The 
The third is um, a retooling of our interest in stimulating collaborative efforts between computational methods and, um, and cancer research. Uh, computational systems, biology of cancer is its new, new term. Uh, the next is a individual investigator research award for clinical translation designed to support the uh, translation to patients of Texas innovations in therapeutics. And then the last is um, an individual investigator research um, award for prevention and early detection. Again, the idea is to bring new ideas um, for um, early detection or prevention uh, that is that are being evaluated in either patient populations or populations at risk for developing cancer. So, uh, Mr. Margo, those are the two action items that um, from the research committee or research program. Are there any questions for Dr. Wilson? Yes, sir. If if I may, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Wilson, I just want to note, I think I'm right in that of the individual investigators, five of nine are women and the first time tenure track people, four out of seven are women. I think that's a terrific, uh, a terrific result. I know we, we always want to have the best science possible, but I'm just very encouraged that we have, you know, a majority of grantees are women researchers. So that's all. If I could follow, because I I think that's really an important um, uh, observation. And just to reflect back, which we have over the last several years, that not only are um, the new investigators being recruited to build programs, but they're also assuming leadership positions. And several of the um, CFERD awardees are in fact now leading major uh, departments and institutes at our Texas institutions. So th thank you, Mr. Montgomery, for bringing that important topic up. Yeah, bravo. I think it's it's great. Mr. Burgess has certified compliance for the academic research award process. It is my understanding that no oversight committee member reported any conflicts of interest. Are there any conflicts of interest not reported? Members, you have the list of applications and grant amounts recommended by the PIC for the Academic Research Grant Awards. We'll approve the PIC's recommendation if two thirds of the Oversight Committee members agree. There are two Academic Research Award slates con constituting nine grant recommendations. Rather than taking a separate vote on the, on the grant mechanism, uh, taking a separate vote, the grant mechanisms, I will ask for a vote to approve both slates. If a member wants to consider an award recommendation separately, please make a motion to do so now. Hearing none, I will entertain a motion to approve the PICS nine recommendations for the, for the recruitment of established investigators and the recruitment of first time tenure track faculty members. So, so moved. moved. Second. All in favor vote aye. 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 Be opposed? Hearing approval from at least two thirds of the members, the motion carries. I will entertain a motion delegating contract negotiation authority to the CEO and CPRIT staff and to authorize the CEO to sign the contracts on behalf of CPRIT. So moved. Is there a second? second? All in second. favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Dr. Wilson has presented the proposed timeline and academic research program RFAs. CPRIT will release for the first cycle of FY 2022. I will entertain a motion approving the proposed timeline and academic research program RFAs for the first cycle of FY 2022 as presented by Dr. Wilson. So moved. Second. All in favor vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. The chair recognizes Mrs. Magid, Ms. Magid to present the Chief Prevention Officer's report. Good morning, members. Um, the prevention program update is behind tab six, page 6-1 six of the meeting book. Um, I just wanna summarize where we are in the um, application cycles. 12 applications were reviewed for the expansion of services mechanism and are currently under review. And um, they'll be presented to you in May of 2021. 
and the application receipt system opened on this past Monday for cycle two of FY 2021. And all four mechanisms are available during this cycle. Applications are due in February and the PIC recommendations will be brought forward at the August 2021 Oversight Committee meeting. The um, FY 2022 program priorities agenda item will follow Cindy's report, but I wanted to bring to your attention one additional prevention program priority on page 6-3. This priority was suggested by both the advisory committee and the review council and is being recommended by the oversight committee prevention subcommittee. And this um, additional priority is the program assessment to identify best practices and be used as a quality improvement tool and to guide future program direction. And you will take action on that at a later time. The other priorities remain unchanged. I've also been asked by the sub subcommittee members to provide some information on the impact of COVID on CPRIT funded prevention programs. And I have a few slides. So just briefly, I just have a few slides. I wanted to show you some um, national data from the uh, National Health Network. And um, this data shows that screenings were drastically down for breast, cervical, and colon cancers, and um, colonoscopies, biopsies, you know, 90% decrease compared with 2019, as well as both diagnosis C's and surgeries, both fell as compared to 2019. And there are many factors involved here. Um, patient factors were, you know, Preventive services are low priority during this time. There's reluctance, there's fear, there's apprehension, there's perceived risk of exposure to COVID. Many people have lost their health insurance due to loss of jobs. There's been some stay at home orders and there's also been lack of um, you know, broadband access and technology literacy. You know, we, we don't often think about that as, as um, privileged people who are have that readily available. The other factors involve providers and um, systems. There have been PPE shortages and many personnel have been pulled away to work on COVID. And people can't schedule as many procedures or protocols because they have to accommodate the COVID procedures. And then there've been um, staff layoffs when clinics and programs were closed and it's very difficult to restart programs. So those are some of the um, factors involved in the decrease. And I wanted to also show you secret quarterly data. This is 2019 versus 2020. 2019 is the um, gold line and 2020 is the blue line. So the one that's falling precipitously. So what this shows you um, obviously is there's been a huge decrease and these are fiscal year quarters. So Q4 2020 is the last set of data that we have and that was June, July, August of this year. The next data will be available um, in December. Could I ask a quick question? Sure. Mr. Chairman, I hate to interrupt, but are these data national or statewide or? These are separate project okay. data. Okay. Just our current program projects. They thank report you. their data quarterly. Dr. Rice. Yeah, thank you. I just wonder, Ramona, what do you think about Q3 and 19? What, what was going on in Q3 of 19? If I'm reading that right, it seems like it had a big old dip too. Yeah, I'm. I am not, you know, sure about why that dip, um, other than, you know, it, it's, it is odd because it's not the holidays and I don't know whether it's just January, February, people getting back into um, 
program, you know, their regular um, screenings and diagnostics. I'm not sure. I plan to do a little more investigation and I'll let you know if I identify anything. And, and are those, you said it, I think, are those secret quarters so that would, it, would Q3 start in January or February, something like this? It would be this Q1 is August, September, October. Q2 is November, December, January, then February, March, April. I just is don't know Q3. If an annual dip in the, in the winter. But anyway, I would love to know more about that. We, that's yes, a, I certainly yeah. will um, be doing some more research and let you know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So there's good news and bad news about this. Obviously, the bad news is we're going in the wrong direction with our COVID numbers. And so um, with positivity rates and hospitalizations. So there may be. Um, more delays in elective procedures and screenings, biopsies, maybe more stay at home orders. And I think the fear and apprehension and reluctance to participate will also increase as um, our numbers stay high. Ramona, and it, I'm sorry to interrupt again. I just have a request as you go back and look at that, I would ask for two things if it's possible and easy. One is Give us the calendar. I'm still on this slide. Give us the count, you know, move our move that calendar so we'll know it's Q1, January, February, March, April, May, June. Give us the Q, the quarterly, if you don't mind, and calendar, even if you have to sort of go back and mix our traditional data, because that the whole world looks, the, you know, uh, at quarters starting with January. I'm just going to make that request. Second thing is it'd be interesting if it was by month, because I'd love to sort of see by month how cancer screening dips knowing that we've had different kinds of surges through this year. And I anticipate that might be of interest just for us to learn about it. Um, okay. Um, in response to your first request, I can do that. We do not collect data monthly. We just collect it quarterly. Never mind. Perfect. So, Thank you. Um, Sorry to interrupt. No, no worries. Thank you. Um, so, and, you know, I mean, with cancer, you know that um, if screenings are delayed, then cancers might be missed or they've been diagnosed at later stage. And of course, the longer the pandemic goes on, the more serious the consequences of this is. However, some of the articles I've read um, say, you know, a few months is not going to make a big difference in diagnoses, um, except lung cancer is the um, probably will make the, the biggest difference. But as I said, the longer it goes on, it could change the consequences. The good news, of course, is our you know recent positive news about the vaccine. Clinics have been reopening and continue to reopen, and they are providing cancer screenings and diagnostics on a much more regular basis. And um, our grantees are doing a remarkable jo time job during these times, and I like to take this opportunity to publicly acknowledge and congratulate all of our program directors and their staffs, program staffs, for doing such a good job during these times. They've worked tirelessly to keep their programs moving along. And these are just some of the things that our secret grantees are doing. They're um, working very closely with providers to monitor the closures and the decreased um, appointment availability. They've quickly changed procedures to accommodate COVID social distancing. They've pivoted to a lot of online and virtual education and outreach. They've enhanced patient navigation where they just do call back after call back after call back, pushing people to, to go in, especially those that had a positive screening test. They have taken the opportunity to broaden their message when they're giving out cancer prevention, education and information. They're also including the importance and safety of regular screenings and diagnostic testing. They're continually seeking out new collaborative partners. So if their you know, usual partners say their clinic is closed down. They're looking for new partners. And as far as internally, they've been requesting contract extensions with CPRIT to, to fully complete their goals and objectives. They're determined to um, make good on their goals and objectives. And they've 
can all stay in close contact with me, um, reporting any oddities or um, unusual requests. So they've done a remarkable job and I just want to thank them and say that, um, you know, they're, they're doing their best. So um, in addition to this that I've reported out, there will be a full COVID section in CPRIT's annual report and that is um, will be coming out in January of 2021. So I just want to leave you with this is I borrowed the quote from somewhere it's, you know, this is the best test is the one that gets done. And so what can each of us do? And I just want to say to keep talking about the importance and the safety of regular cancer screenings and encourage everyone to continue to complete their screenings and especially if they have a positive screening to continue on with their diagnostic testing. And with that, I'm happy to um, answer any questions. Looks like Dr. Rice, you have a question first. I was just, yes, Bart, forgive me, um, but I was just gonna ask quickly, did any of the, does any of the decreased testing that maybe we're seeing inside our system have a budgetary impact, good or bad? And does that change how we think about, you know, how we can extend efficiency or anything? Does it, does it have a budgetary impact? Um, and I think I was alluding to that by the contract extensions. They're taking longer to spend their funds because of further testing, but they are committed to meet their numbers of people um, that they said they would test. So it will take longer to spend their funds um, by extending their contracts. But Thank other you. than that, it doesn't have a budget. You know, we'll be giving out less money, reimbursing less money each quarter, but for a longer period of time. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Ramona, do you all, do you have individual uh, information? Like, uh, I'd like to know how it's, it's going with Texas Tech here with Dr. Shokar and all of her work. Uh, I do a weekly press conference on COVID. Uh, unfortunately. Um, so do you have that data or do I need to call Texas Tech and find out from them? Um, I'll work with her to provide you the data. I'd like to know something by, the, by tomorrow if I can and I'd like- Okay, to I'll work with her today to- okay. I'd, li um, I'd like a copy of your slides as well. Yes, I plan to, to send those to everybody. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe Dr. Hernandez Yes, ma'am. Can you go? Can you go back to your slide where you're showing the data for the quarters, the four quarters? That one. So we have we have partners, correct? That, that contribute to this data that we fund. Yes, this is grantee data. Right. Okay. And you only obtain data every quarter, not every month. Correct. So um, it's kind of curious when you saw that those dips go down. So what did you do as an organization? when you reach out to your partners to let them know what's the problem? Why, why are we not utilizing these funds like we're supposed to? What did they tell you? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question. They are, these are just the number of screenings and diagnostics. They no, do out, outreach, they do education. Um, right. But you fund them, don't you? We're funding these projects, yes. Right. So when, when these numbers started dropping because there's less occurring, so did, did they communicate to you the reason why their numbers are, why they're not doing the number of diagnostics on our screenings? What did they tell you? Well, there's not a, um, a quarterly quota say. They, they provide when they um, present their projects, they give an overall number. And there's a seasonal um, difference in the numbers. We've seen that from the beginning. So we don't, um, judge them on numbers provided each quarter. It's yearly, they do an annual report and they provide the numbers then. So it, it tends to average out. As you can see in 2019, you know, it dipped, but then it, um, it dipped 10,000. Well, these are probably 70 
70 grants reporting. So it's not um, unusual to see that variation. In, so this, in so this data doesn't surprise you. Is that, what you're, is that what you're trying to say? Absolutely not. No, I think if I would go back and and look at other data for the other um, quarters, other than obviously the COVID influence, it wouldn't be any different. There would be well, well, major fluctuations. Yeah, quarter quarter. Nothing, nothing to do with COVID. I'm just wondering whether it's such a dip down what people are doing during those time periods. And I'm sure there's they're recruiting people, they're um, doing outreach and education, and it depends on the providers too. They don't always have the capacity to keep a steady, um, you know, influx of CPRIT patients because they are generally underserved, uninsured patients. So it could depend, maybe a provider is just in the contract phase, maybe they've quit their contract. There are all kinds of reasons for the fluctuations. Right, okay, so uh, I guess I'll talk to you offline. I'll get more information from you. Sure, okay, I'm happy to provide any information. Thank you. Any other questions for Ramona? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Walker Peach will provide the product development program update. Hello, thank you. I'm just going to wait here for my slides to show up. Um, my, my update was very brief. I thank you all for your time today. Um, members, I would uh, refer you to the electronic meeting book um, behind uh, tab seven for the update today. The printed copies inadvertently contained an incorrect version of my memo. So please uh, refer to the electronic meeting book uh, for today. Um, if I may have the first slide, please, Rosemary. Um, I'm happy to report that the product development research uh, has restarted its grant making process after the hiatus due to the budget uncertainty. Can I have the next slide, please, Rosemary? Um, so here we go with uh, FY 2021 cycle one. This is a quick update for you. Uh, just as a reminder, these RFAs were approved during our special OC in uh, July, uh, on July 31st of 2020. So all three of the current product development research uh, award mechanisms will be opening. The request for applications was posted last week on November 9th. And I've highlighted that we're holding a webinar tomorrow, all of which all of you are, are invited to join that if you're interested in learning more about our award mechanisms. Um, the application portal will open in December, early December, we'll close at the end of January, and then we'll start our peer review process, which will run from January through July of next year. And we anticipate bringing award recommendations for your consideration at the August 2021 OC uh, meeting. Uh, next slide, please. Just as a reminder, these are the three product development RFAs that we are, are, are uh, opening during FY21.1. The Texas Company Product Development uh, Research Awards uh, for early stage companies already in Texas. The Company Relocation Product Development Research Awards for those companies willing to relocate to the state of Texas. And then the seed award mechanism, and you heard from, uh, from Dr. May, Wei, uh, from May Wang this morning on her, her company who was the seed awardee uh, uh, winner. So with that, I, again, very short and sweet today. I'm happy to entertain any questions um, that anyone may have at this point. Any questions for Dr. Walker Peach? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on. Thank you all. Members, we are taking up agenda item 12 now. Mr. Roberts, please present secret staff recommendations for the fiscal year 2022 program priorities. Thank you, Mr. Margo. I'm looking at the material behind tab eight of the meeting book, uh, and this will be brief. Uh, with changes noted uh, in the cover memo, the 22 program priorities are the same as the priorities adopted by you last November for fiscal year 2021. Each program officer discussed the priorities, uh, proposed, proposed priorities for fiscal year 22 with their respective subcommittees in meetings earlier this month. All subcommittees recommended approval of these. Uh, as a result, I recommend that you approve the fiscal year 2022 program priorities as presented behind the, the cover memo. 
Uh, that's brief. Uh, I'll expand uh, your request. Uh, if not, I'll be happy to take any questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Roberts or the program officers? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion to approve the fiscal 2022 program priorities. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. The chair now recognizes Mr. Graves to present CPRIT's internal audit report, audit reports, and the FY fiscal year 2020 internal audit annual report. Good morning. Thank you for having me this morning. Uh, if you'll all turn to the section 91 in your materials, uh, that is our report for the uh, final uh, wrap up of the 2020 internal audit plan. Uh, this morning I have two reports to present to you. Uh, the first one being governance uh, and then disaster recovery and, and our advisory report over disaster recovery and business continuity planning. Uh, since it's earlier in your handbook, uh, if you go to section 9.5, we'll start with disaster recovery and business continuity planning. Uh, we did finalize and complete that report uh, on, well, we finalized our procedures on September 29th and then issued the final report uh, on October 28th. Uh, this disaster recovery and business continuity planning advisory project was uh, done in an effort as part of our uh, internal audit plan, uh, but it's a little bit different in nature than the reports and procedures we performed for CPRIT in the past. Uh, in the past, it has been strictly a uh, internal audit. Uh, these were internal audit advisory procedures. And so the difference is that we use the consulting standards under the uh, IIA methodology, the Institute of Internal Auditors methodology. And because of that, there's a few differences in the report that I'd like to highlight. Um, the focus of the advisory versus an internal audit is really to assist the agency in improving and making um, steps forward. Uh, not that we don't do that in an internal audit, but this was really in a consulting capacity so that we could dive in deep, provide some specific recommendations, um, provide some detail edits that I'll talk about here in just a moment and um, really assist the agency a little bit more than we can uh, from a, an audit perspective. Now we haven't impaired our independence. We're absolutely available to come back and audit this area in the future uh, because the management of the agency will have to take what we've provided them um, and own it and implement it and really make the management decision to, of how it gets deployed. However, it did allow us a little bit deeper dive. Uh, and so uh, that is, uh, like I said, uh, section 9.5 in your materials. And uh, so just a high level overview of what we did and the results is we, we essentially took the three uh, standards that we used were from the State Office of Risk Management and their continuity planning uh, checklist and materials. Uh, also, the continuity planning and disaster recovery criteria from the Department of Information Resources. Uh, so those two state agencies. And then we also use the National Institute uh, of, and Standards for Technology, so NIST and their continuity planning guide as a best practice. And took all of CPRIT's uh, suite of disaster recovery and business continuity documents. And we reviewed those, compared those to uh, the standards for the from the two state agencies and NIST and uh, came up with a set of recommendations and improvements for the documentation and procedures. And you'll see we provided 30 different recommendations uh, and proposed revisions to the technical documentation uh, to secret management. Of those 30, 24 of those were uh, recommendations to augment current information, uh, augment or, or clarify. And then six were specific to improve clarity of those um, areas. And then of those 30, 
Um, 24 of those, or sorry, 23 of those, we provided specific draft edits in the documentation. Uh, we pr provided a red line version to secret management of uh, our proposed uh, thoughts of how to address those recommendations. And then seven of those recommendations were technical uh, information and that would need to be updated by CPRIT's management and IT department for the technical information regarding the IT systems and response. Um, so with that, we, we gave that documentation, provided, had a very collaborative work, several very collaborative work sessions with the IT department, uh, Heidi, and uh, other management of, of CPRIT and came up with those recommendations and, and provided those all separately from the report to them. Uh, and so that's, that's why it looks a little bit different because of the level of detail that we were able to dive into. Uh, that's also why there is no rating on the report because it was advisory and improvement and um, more forward looking and not a, an audit specifically over the effectiveness of the procedures. There is no rating uh, on this report that you're used to seeing. Uh, however, we do intend to follow up on uh, the implementation and direction of, of the recommendations uh, in the fiscal 2021 internal audit plan. So do we have, I, I, I'll pause now um, if you'd like to answer any questions specific this, to this report before I move on to governance. Dr. Sure. Wright? Just a 10 second question. I'm looking on page 913 and I was trying to figure out the the it says the type it'd be one, two, three for the fourth column. It's the count and then the type T-Y-P-E. What is R and OA? Is R a recommendation OA something else? What is R and OA in that fourth column on the bottom table of page 913? Do you remember? I just was trying to figure out. They're defined. The They're defined at the bottom of the page. Yes. Oh, yeah. Right. I'm sorry you froze. Um, I, I'm assuming you're asking about the, ah, I see the, the R right, versus I'm, the OA. Yeah, I apologize. They're right there in front of me. Monkey. Okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. Brain cramp. Uh, Dan, I'm just can just for clarification, when you look at 30 items, that's that's a lot and that can be misconstrued. Were these uh clarifications, cleanups, uh technical issues or were they material? Not that they would be immaterial, but uh, just how severe or how concerning uh, was this? Uh, overall, not highly concerning. There, there okay. were no items specifically of those 30 that, that were okay. what you might qualify as a big miss. Um, okay. I, I largely, thought that would be the case, but I wanted to get clarification. Yeah, in, in a, a suite of 13 different documents for their uh, for the whole disaster recovery and business continuity, it was really well covered, and most were clarifications okay. or adding right. some technical detail that would be of assistance. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Go ahead and continue. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, I'll move to then our governance audit. Um, that report is on page 9-16 of your handout. <clears throat> and so this one um, is also a little bit different. Uh, it is an audit and we do have a rating. And so you'll see uh, that the rating uh, is a strong rating, which is the highest rating that we have. Uh, we did have one finding regarding this, but I wanted to, to kind of give you a little bit of background um, over governance. Governance is so pervasive and we've covered so many different elements of governance uh, as we've conducted audits over the last several years. Well, I guess since 2015 and so what we wanted to do and, and what we thought would be most beneficial to CPRIT was really to take governance and compare it against uh, the international internal control framework, which is developed by COSO. Uh, COSO is a joint organization of about five different professional organizations that came up with an international internal framework, internal control framework, uh, which you know, provides the guidance and oversight to any organization that adopts that framework. So we actually took all of the historical information that we knew about CPRIT from all the other audits and mapped them to all the individual components of COSO. So there's within COSO, there's, there's five components. Within those five components, there's 17 principles and then 77 points of focus within 
those 17 principles. So it was a lot of mapping um, and, and a lot of coverage that we feel really comfortable with, um, especially only coming up with one uh, finding that has a moderate rating that was really about um, improving the timeliness of review of reports that you receive from other service providers. Uh, so with that, we're, you know, both the objective of the audit and the overall audit received a strong rating and we do have plans to follow up on that one finding in the 2021 uh, internal audit plan. So I'll pause for any questions on this report as well. I don't see any hands up, so go ahead and finish. All right. Will, do you have a question? No, oh. just congratulations to, to Heidi, her staff, uh, to, uh, yeah, to no questions, just congratulations. Yeah. It's a, it's Sorry, it's a, it's, this is an area that people don't pay attention to because it's for the rest of the world is a little boring, but congratulations to everybody. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it really has a lot to do with the, the strong policies, procedures that uh, Heidi and her team and then Kristen um, also really help and guide. So it's, I'm, I'm very pleased to present that, that strong rating. Um, so finally, just wanted to provide you a status on the remaining two items. We did have a couple follow-ups uh, planned in the 2020 uh, internal audit plan. Uh, one of those is for communications uh, to follow up on the three findings from communications. And then we have uh, IT security. Uh, as you know, we've, we've delayed and pushed those into the 2021 internal audit plan. Uh, we'll be working on communication this month and then for the information security and IT based information, we'll be performing those follow ups in January, along with our 2021 internal audit activities. Uh, those include the advisory work, uh, similar to what we did on disaster recovery. We'll be doing that with a sunset self assessment. Then we'll do a full audit over information technology, uh, general computer controls in January and followed by records management uh, advisory in 2021, and then all, the, all of our remaining follow-ups. Uh, on page nine, four of your handout, we have our uh, chart of all the internal audit findings and status of all the findings for you, uh, for your reference. Uh, but the final report I have for you today is uh, on, in section 9-29, that is our annual internal audit report. Uh, if you recall at the last meeting, uh, we requested an extension from the state auditor's office knowing that uh, you wouldn't have the ability to review and approve it until today. Uh, they've awarded us that extension and this report is the summary of all the internal audit activity uh, for fiscal year 2020. Uh, it also includes the 2021 uh, internal audit plan. Uh, it's divided into seven, seven sections. Those seven sections are uh, in the report, uh, the format and content of those sections is prescribed by the state auditor's office. Uh, and we've provided that uh, to you for your review and approval. Uh, once that's been accepted and approved, we will uh, submit this report to the SAO, the LBB uh, and the governor's office as required by the Texas Internal Audit Act and uh, we'll provide the finalized report uh, to Heidi and Terry to be posted on Secret's website, also in compliance with the Texas Internal Audit Act. Any questions for Mr. Graves? Okay, seeing no hands. Is there a motion to approve the Disaster Recovery and Business Continuity Planning Advisory Audit Report and the Internal Audit Report over governance? So moved. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Is there a motion to approve the fiscal year 2020 internal audit report? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Again, congratulations, as Will said, to uh, Heidi and Kristen and staff. Great job. Uh, we are going to take up agenda items 14 and 15 together. The chair recognizes Mr. Roberts to present his eight appointments to the Scientific Research and Prevention Program Committees 
and my appointment of Dr. Berenson to the Prevention Advisory Committee. Thank you, Mr. Margo. Um, I have appointed eight experts to CPRIT's Scientific Research and Prevention Programs Committee. This is better known uh, as the peer review panels, if you will. Uh, our statute requires the Oversight Committee ap to approve uh, these appointments. Each program officer discuss these nominations with their respective subcommittees. Uh, the nomination subcommittee discussed the appointments at its meeting on uh, November the, the 13th, and it recommends approval as well. Uh, therefore, I request approval. The second item uh, are the appointments to the advisory committee. As Mr. Margo uh, pointed out, he has uh, uh, appointed uh, Dr. Uh, Abby Berenson uh, to the uh, Prevention Advisory Committee. Uh, this does require oversight committee approval. Um, in addition, uh, just to call to your attention, uh, the University Advisory Committee, uh, which its composition is established in state law, therefore its membership uh, is provided differently. The members to the University Advisory Committee are uh, nominated or appointed by the chancellors or the presidents of the relevant institutions. Um, we received, uh, after this material was presented, uh, an appointment of, again, Dr. Berenson uh, to the University Advisory Committee to replace uh, Dr. Neisel uh, from UT Medical Branch, who is retiring. Uh, so the action that you've got here is you need to approve uh, Dr. Berenson uh, to the Prevention Advisory Committee, as well as uh, the Nominations Committee's uh, recommendations uh, to approve uh, my provisional appointments uh, to the peer review committees. Are there any questions for Mr. Roberts for the Nominations Committee, subcommittee? Is there a motion to approve the CEO's eight appointments to the Scientific Research and Prevention Program Committee? No move. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Is there a motion to approve Dr. Berenson's appointment to the Prevention Advisory Committee? So moved. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. The chair now recognizes Ms. Eckel to discuss the proposed administrative rule changes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there are two proposed rule amendments to Chapter 703. Uh, the first one relates to 703.3, and it notifies grant applicants that if CPRIT sets a minimum level of effort requirements, that those requirements will be stated in the Request for Applications, or RFA, that's available on CPRIT's website. And the second proposed amendment affects section 703.26 and it clarifies unallowable grantee expenses related to professional association uh, fees and dues and specifically it clarifies that uh, dues for an individual employee are not reimbursable uh, but professional association fees or dues that are paid by the grantee for the entity's membership in a professional organization may be allowed if they benefit the grant and that organization is not involved in lobbying. If approved, the amendments will be published in the Texas Register for public comment and a final order will be brought back at, for the February Oversight Committee meeting. And that is it for the proposed rules. Any questions for Ms. Eckel? Okay, members, there is a motion to approve the publication of the proposed changes to Texas Administrative Code Chapter 703 in the Texas Register. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. The chair recognizes Ms. McConnell for to present the Chief Operating Officer's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good afternoon, members. Um, I'm sorry, good morning. <laughs> I'm trying to move on. Good morning. 
Um, I just wanted to highlight a few items from the report that you have before you. Um, one is that um, in 2020, we received almost $950,000 in revenue sharing payments from our grantees. Um, and uh, approximately $580,000 of that was from a milestone payment from Merck uh, for the acquisition of one of our early um, company awards, which was Peloton. Um, so that, that makes up more than half of that, um, for those revenue sharing payments for the year. Um, with regard to our um, performance measures, um, I just I wanted to highlight the fact that um, uh, the cancer mortality rate measure has declined significantly in the past 10 years um, from 171.7 people dying from cancer per $100,000 population to 142.9 people dying, um, which was the last number uh, reported in 2020. Um, and keep in mind that that's also about, two, the data is about lagged about two years. Um, and we do receive this data from the Texas Cancer Registry at the Department of Health Services. Um, but anyway, I just thought that that was, it puts a little bit of perspective to those numbers um, and, and is uh, you know, a significant decline. Um, the last item was, um, is on our debt issuance history. Um, we did complete our issuance uh, for FY 2020 of $231.3 million back in April. Um, so the most recent issuance in September was actually for FY 2021 of $75 million um, in commercial paper notes um, that TPFA issued on our behalf. Um, and that is uh, to cover our operating expenses uh, for this year. Um, as well as the transfer to the Department of State Health Services and some of our grant payments. Um, and the total we anticipate um, issuing this year is $260.3 million. So that's just the start. Um, that's all I have, unless you have any questions. Any questions for uh, Ms. McConnell? I see no hands. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cutrone will update us on CPRIT's communication activities. Uh, Mayor Margo, Oversight Committee members, good morning. I am uh, Chris Cutrone, CPRIT uh, Senior Communications Specialist. You will find the communication update on tab 14.1 uh, of your meeting packet. CPRIT's media coverage over the last quarter was primarily published after the announcement of our last round of awards in August. The Dallas Morning News, D Magazine, and Dallas Innovates ran stories on Super Product Development Award recipient Onco Nano. San Antonio was also a bright spot for coverage uh, with the Business Journal, San Antonio Express News, and KSAT doing features on our August round of grants. Um, you will also see a list of notable articles in my update, and I've included those articles for your review starting on tab 14.4 of your packet. Some notable communications activities include uh, continued improvements and updates to the website and its user experience. With October being Liver Cancer Awareness Month, we launched a page highlighting projects we are funding in liver cancer, notably the Liver Cancer Collaborative Action Program, a multi-institutional initiative that's being administered out of Baylor College of Medicine. There's good information on the page about what C-funded researchers are doing. Um, to fight liver cancer, including a number of videos we produced. Over time, we plan to expand the number of projects featured, including in prevention and product development. And the page can be found at livercancer.sepret.texas.gov. We are also about to soft launch our Scholar app in early December. This online tool will allow secret scholars themselves and their institutions to update Scholar profiles on our website. I will work with counterparts at the institutions for training and support when we deploy the application. And uh, just as a reminder, our Scholar profiles can be found at uh, scholars.sepret.texas.gov. I would like to point out that the Secret IT team has been instrumental in supporting these types of projects for communications. Uh, finally, this quarter, we had some very important cancer awareness months with September as Childhood Cancer Awareness and October as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And as I've mentioned to y'all before, these awareness months are a great opportunity to highlight our grantees and that continues to guide our content creation. That includes that concludes my update for this quarter and I'm happy, happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Cutrone? 
Okay, thank you, Chris. We will not take up standing agenda items 19, 20, or 21. The next regular oversight committee meeting will convene on February the 17th, 2021. Seaport expects to hold the February meeting by video conference. If there is no further business and no objection, the chair moves to adjourn this meeting. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion stands, motion carries. The meeting stands adjourned at 11.08 a.m.